durable, pretty easy to make, looks good. At least I think they look good. This is a pretty cool project. Hey guys, welcome back to Black Magic Craft. While I might have a big frost grave table set up here because that's what we were playing last week, the build part of my head is definitely caught up in the post-apocalyptic futuristic territory that I started last week. Those concrete ruins really got me jacked up and excited to continue with that theme. I really want to get to a point where I can fully populate a board like this with appropriate terrain for kill team so that we can start playing kill team once in a while so i decided to add to my massive collection of those concrete ruins that i built last week by making these modular steel barricades and i'm pretty happy with the way they turned out what i love about them is that they can be used in a ton of different ways the way i constructed them you can lay them out however you'd like in different positions to create barricades or even buildings or structures. They work well with those concrete ruins. They're really friggin' durable. They have a nice weight to them. They're balanced. They sit on the table nicely. All in all, they are what I would consider to be a perfect bit of scatter terrain. I'm pretty sure actually I could probably even put stuff on top of them the way they're designed. Anyways, these are a really fun project. I like the results. I'm going to show you how I made them so you can make some of your own. All right, the main component of this build is every futuristic terrain builder's go-to material, and that's granny grading, or I think it's properly called plastic canvas. You can buy this stuff for cheap from most craft stores, and you're going to find it in the section by the yarn. I cut it into strips that were one and five eighths of an inch wide for those of you who love measurements, making sure to always keep a finished edge and not to have a bunch of cross cut pieces. I decided three inches long would be a good length for these pieces as most of the terrain that I make is in a form factor of three inches. This will allow these barricades to lay out nicely on 12 inch tiles or boards that work in one foot increments. The cutting mat guide was the fastest way to get my first piece. After that, I used it as the master to cut the rest. In total, I cut out 24 of these. I wanted to make 12 barricades and each needed two pieces. Before going any further, I primed the mesh with aerosol primer. Whatever plastic they use for this stuff is insanely difficult to work with in terms of adhesion. Nothing sticks to it, not even super glue. Spray primer sticks to it pretty good, so priming them now would later allow me to more easily glue them as the glue would stick better to the primer. I wanted these pieces to be solid and have some weight to them. The trick to achieving this was a core of medium weight chipboard. So I cut out a dozen pieces of chipboard the same size as the mesh. These walls needed something to help them stand. So I decided creating some tapered concrete looking bases would be the best way to go, inspired by those highway barricades you often see. XPS foam was the material of choice for this. I ripped half inch square strips to start. I then set my wire to a 45 degree angle. I had to switch to my Guider Pro 2.0 for this as it has a channel to allow angled wire to pass through it, unlike the original version that I use most of the time. With the angle set, I chamfered two edges of each strip. I then set the wire back to 90 degrees and split the sections exactly in half. This gave me two mirrored pieces with chamfered edges that I would put aside for use later. Now to start actually assembling, I needed a way to attach the mesh to the chipboard. This is actually more difficult than it might seem. 
I couldn't use any glues that squeezed out excess into the pattern, and I didn't want anything that would take a long time to dry. I also didn't want to waste a ton of super glue on this. This really limited my options. I turned to one of my favorite workhorse glues that tends to always be the answer in situations like this, and that's the 3M Super 77. It's a tacky spray glue that works incredibly well. I sprayed all the mesh outdoors off camera and quickly came back inside and started attaching the mesh to the chipboard. I had to go back out a few times to spray the mesh again as the tackiness of the glue only lasts so long. You have a pretty limited working time with this stuff. These could be left just like this. The mesh alone gives a perfectly serviceable look, but personally, I don't really like it when a material just looks like the material. The stuff is really recognizable when used in a build. I wanted to add a lot more visual interest to this, so I opted to add a bunch of strips of construction paper to kind of break up the pattern. Using super glue, I attached all my strips of paper. This was incredibly tedious work, and in all honesty, was not very fun to do. This portion of the build took the majority of the time, it was repetitive and quite annoying, but the trade-off is well worth it in my opinion, but your mileage may vary. Because I wasn't totally fed up with mind-numbing repetitive tasks, I opted to add one more strip of chipboard to the top of each piece to finish off the top edge. I simply cut some strips of chipboard to the width of the wall and super glued them in place. Thankfully, I could now get back to some more enjoyable work and I grabbed the strips of foam that I had made earlier and hot glued them to the walls. I could have flush cut off the excess, but I wanted these to be really modular. I wanted them to be able to be laid out in a straight line, but also at angles. In order to make them work as corners, I cut the foam at a 45 degree angle. This way they could be butted up to each other in any orientation I wanted. This little step was the most important in the whole build in terms of usability. Of course, the foam needed to have some texture and damage added, which I did using the same techniques used in last week's ruins video. I chopped up a few of the walls to create damaged ones, and in retrospect, probably could have made even more so that I had lots of damaged sections, but I really didn't want to spend more hours gluing strips of paper, so I just hacked up some of the ones I already had. I decided to try something a bit different with these in order to make the foam bases a bit more durable. Using tacky glue, I glued the pieces directly to pieces of construction paper. While they were in place, it provided me an easy way to hold them while I brushed on my Mod Podge coating, but then once dry, I could just cut away the excess paper. This little layer of paper underneath the foam actually does a really good job of protecting the edge of the foam and it nicely finishes off the bottom of the walls should anyone happen to look. For the paint, I gave everything another coat of flat gray spray primer and set to work airbrushing on some color. Now, I don't use my airbrush nearly enough, and one of the reasons I don't use it enough is because I don't have enough experience with it to be totally comfortable with it. It's a bit of a vicious cycle. So in an effort to stop this, I decided to play around with the airbrush a lot with these. I'm not gonna go into too much detail on the paint as most of it was just spent waffling around trying out different things, but the basic premise of what I did was spraying out the gray primer with a brown that was an appropriate shade for rust. I intentionally made this application really patchy and darker in different areas. Then I used a few other shades of darker and lighter browns to make a variety of random and organic looking patches. In addition to model paints, I also used the Mission Model Light Rust that I showed in a previous video that you can go check out on the top of the screen if you are so inclined. I experimented with stippling on some gunmetal gray to have some metal show through, but in all honesty, it mostly looked awful and I ended up covering most of it again with the Mission Model Rust Paint because I didn't like it. I also messed around and created a textured sludge using a mix of Green Stuff World Dry Pigment, 
binder and acrylic inks to create sort of a texture paste that I could stipple on to create areas of heavy old rust. I played around with this so much that I couldn't even begin to tell you the mix I used as it was a lot of trial and error until I got something that I thought looked okay. By the end of it, I had lost track of what was actually in the mix. So my main goal here is to encourage you to just play around with mixing different stuff and don't be afraid to apply it to your piece. If you don't like something, you can just keep redoing it and trying different things. It's just paint. I wanted to continue using the airbrush to paint out the concrete and cover the overspray from the walls. My skills aren't nearly good enough yet to freehand that hard transition between the colors. So I masked off the walls with tape and painted out the concrete in gray. I didn't apply any black wash to the rusted metal parts as I was pretty content with their look, but I did use my homemade black wash on the concrete portions. I again used the Mission Model Rust to create streaks onto the concrete. I did this in varying amounts from piece to piece and in the end I liked the ones where I was a lot more minimal than the one I filmed here. I think this is definitely a case where less is more. I'm really in love with this project. These walls are incredibly modular, have a lot of reusability, they look pretty cool, and while I'm still what I'd consider an intermediate painter, I really enjoyed trying out a lot of new things on these. The rust isn't perfect, but it looks believable enough on a table full of terrain. If you're just getting into this hobby and want some starting guidance as to what to buy to start doing this stuff, or if you're experienced and you just want to expand your arsenal of tools and supplies, check out my essential equipment page on blackmagiccraft.ca. I've curated a list of the stuff that I use the most and explanations as to why. This way you can be sure you're buying the right items and by doing your shopping through those affiliate links, you are actually helping to fund the production of videos like this one. Doing these videos every week, two videos every week, is an incredibly demanding process in terms of time. And the only reason I'm able to continuously do it is because of the additional support I receive on Patreon. If what I'm doing helps you and you get a lot of value from my videos, consider joining up and supporting the channel there. A few bucks a month goes a long way to helping this channel continue to succeed and grow. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with some friends who might also enjoy it. That's it for this week, guys. Thanks for watching. Cheers.